Good evening and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Gandek. I'm the Communications Manager here at Lynn Community Health Center. We're so excited to have you all with us tonight to view a conversation between Dr. Kiyomi Mahanya and actor and writer Jason Manzukis. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Kiyomi Mahanya, our CEO, uh, to introduce the rest of tonight's session. Kiyomi. Welcome to our audience. I'm sad I can't see you, but I can feel your warmth and your smiles out there. I'm Kiyomi Mahanya. I'm a practicing family physician and the CEO of the Lynn Community Health Center. So welcome to our inaugural virtual dialogue event in celebration of the Lynn Community Health Center, celebration of our first 50 years. So we're hoping that we're gonna have another one of these in about 50 years. Lynn Community Health Center has really been an integral part of the healthcare landscape in Lynn since its inception, all is responding to both immediate and chronic healthcare needs. Uh, last year was no different. We met the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic with everything we had, and tonight, we will share with you exactly what it is that we did and how we help protect our community. The health center is in downtown Lynn, post-industrial coastal city of about 94,000 people, 10 miles north of Boston. LCHC has a patient census of 43,000 or 40% 40 of the city's population. Our mission is to provide comprehensive health care of the highest quality, for everyone in the greater Lynn community, regardless of ability to pay. From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for your support that has allowed us to continue our work through this very difficult past few years. What has become very clear from this past year in the COVID crisis and the pandemic is just how important our donors are, large and small. You are the ones who have helped sustain us throughout the year. I would like to thank our lead sponsors for making this series possible. Our presenting sponsors, Cambridge Savings Bank and Stainless Communication. Our major sponsors, Commonwealth Radiology Associates, Eastern Bank, and Mass General Brigham, a Salem Hospital. I would also like to thank all of our sponsors for this series. And of course, there's a complete list of our sponsors uh, on our website. And also, None of this can happen really without the behind the scenes work. So I would like to particularly thank Claire Hayes and Kristen Gandick for really being the people behind us that really did an amazing amount of work. I'll be joined by our chief medical officer and our chief operating officer, but the person you really would like to hear from is the person I'm very grateful to for having been my interviewer, who is Jason Manzukas. He was our guest interviewer, and he gave his time and talent to us to reflect on the past months of the COVID pandemic, our lessons learned, and a pathway forward. So, Jason. How are you, Kiami? Well, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's been a while <laughs> since I've seen you. How are things going? I know. In California? Uh, not too bad. My hair and beard have gotten at least twice as long. I mean, you can you can really chart when we when we shot this based on how different my my look will be how how feral i look on video now now versus then i'm i'm excited for people to see the the conversation that we had um they're about to be introduced to one of the hottest new comedy duos in, in town really <laughs> Actually, people kept saying, I can't wait to see a funny thing in COVID. And I kept thinking, well, no, it wasn't that, it wasn't that <laughs> it kind is, of interview. It was, it was not that funny, but it was incredibly informative and very helpful, especially for me, uh, someone who's been like consumed by it all year, to be able to have someone to really dig in and ask questions and get answers. And, and I really, I valued our conversation so much. I was so glad that after the very long audition process I had to go through to get this role <laughs> that I, I really secured it. I, I, I really, I, I hope that my, you know, I, I'm hope, fingers crossed we get nominated for, uh, for some sort of award for this. Best documentary award. <laughs> exactly. Best short form documentary award for a community health center, I think. Yes, we should invent that category. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Jason. And like I mentioned, um, during the Q&A session, we'll be joined by our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Paczynski, and our Chief Operating Officer, uh, Kim Eng. Uh, it would have been difficult to bring in all the people who really made the, the work happen during the pandemic, but the, the two of them will be representative of really the major work that we've done. So I look forward to our discussion. So for now, let's roll the video. Hello. 
Hello everyone, I'm Jason Manzukis, and I'm excited to be here today to interview Dr. Kiyami Mahania, a practicing physician and the Chief Executive Officer at the Lynn Community Health Center in Lynn, Massachusetts. 2021 marks the Health Center's 50th anniversary, and this is the first in a series of videos to celebrate the significant impact of this organization. I might seem like an unlikely choice as an interviewer, but rest assured, there is a connection here. My father, Bill Manzukis, was one of the founders of the Lynn Community Health Center in 1971 and served as its first executive director. I think I've been to almost every physical iteration of the Lynn Community Health Center, so I am very delighted to be here virtually to have this conversation. Jason, I'm very excited uh, that you're here. I'm even doubly excited because of the relationship uh, with your father, who's been a mentor of mine for many years. And I'm very excited about this conversation as well. It's been a wild, unprecedented year this year, the year of COVID, uh, as well as many other things that we're going to discuss in this next talk. The pandemic has laid bare many of the deep injustices in our society and specifically in our healthcare systems. I know that March 4th of last year, 2020, the Lynn Community Health Center launched its emergency operations plan in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as you kind of saw this whole thing unfolding, how were you planning for it and how has it kind of come to pass this last year? Yeah, so in many ways, we were lucky. We decided whatever we were going to do, we had to protect the hospital. That was like our first mission. In the beginning, we didn't have enough PPE. We didn't have enough tests. So it was really um, a leap of faith for us as a community to say, okay, we're going to protect our community by seeing patients, by remaining open for urgent services so that those people don't go into the hospital. What really was amazing was the response of the health center staff. Everybody was really supportive of this idea that we wanted to serve our community, wanted to make sure that we did everything we could to stop our hospital from being overwhelmed. So we remained open. And the real difference that really happened to us was when testing was finally available. Within three weeks, we were able to start testing thousands of people a week. We were able to also offer social services. So we were able to wrap this around and really provide um, services to our patients. That's great. Kiami, you mentioned that uh, the workflow at the health center changed over the course of the last year, having people working from home. I'm curious, like for an organization like the Lynn Community Health Center, how did uh, you all have to shift how you worked and how you treated and saw patients throughout the course of the COVID-19 pandemic? The shifts were brutal. We probably had around 200 employees who didn't have the equipment necessary to work from home. So our, our first week, I think we just bought equipment, trained people, sent them home with the equipment. Um, and then we had to identify, okay, which of our services are we allowed to do remotely? And which of our services can we not do remotely? And we have to either do in person or stop doing. We also knew that there was some work we just wouldn't be able to do, meaning how do we repurpose those employees? One of the things we really wanted to avoid is as this economic crisis unfolded, we didn't want to add another financial dimension to people's anxiety. So as we were repurposing people and redesigning their work, we essentially had people doing things that they never would have imagined doing even just 10 days before, just because it allowed us to keep everybody employed and allowed us to keep providing the services. But I, I must say, um, now it sounds like we had a great plan and we all went step by step, but really it was flying the plane as you were building it. We, literally on Monday, we wouldn't know what we were doing on Friday. I was really worried about uh, our staff's ability to withstand that amount of stress. I mean, there were days, Jason, where we change our particular workflow four times in one day. And I was just so impressed by our staff's ability to respond. And I think it's, it's really because they saw themselves as an essential part of the response. They knew that there wasn't really an option. We knew that if we faltered, the whole community would suffer. I wonder if you can speak a little bit to, as your kind of organization's um, main thrust now shifted to giving the vaccine out. Like, is that now how, what, what, where you guys are kind of focusing your energies? One of the things that 
I was always worried about during the pandemic is, well, yes, we're doing all this testing. We're taking care of all these people that may have COVID symptoms. What's happening to our patients with diabetes? What's happening, what's happening to people who are having strokes out there? We have this incredibly close connection with the city of Lynn. Um, and they provide actually at least half of the staff in the immunization clinic. They're providing, they're paying, they're training, and we're doing the other half. But then 80% of our, the rest of our staff is really concentrating on, can we address this backlog of healthcare issue that has built up before these really become serious medical issues, before the heart attacks happen, before the strokes happen, before the diabetic comas happen. So it really is, you're right, that it's a challenge to A, have the energy and the bandwidth to put up a whole new service, which is the vaccine clinic, and yet at the same time, retain enough energy and wherewithal and managerial bandwidth and staff to provide the regular care that is desperately needed. I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about how the ability to have telehealth or telemedicine increases people's access to care, but also comes with it a bit of a difficulty because not everybody in the communities that you serve has the ability to log on and have a get online and, and interface, you know, using a computer or whatever. One of the things in healthcare that you probably have experienced yourself is that sometimes we make things really, really inconvenient for customers. And one of the visions that we have for our telewellness program is essentially that the, the patient will have the ability to choose. The idea is that we we're trying to provide a, a flexible arena um, that includes phones, phone conversations, obviously, but it also includes video. Uh, it also includes asynchronous contact, meaning that you want to be able to leave messages for your nurse, your provider, your community health worker, and just get an answer later on. As one of the outgrowths of this, we've really identified the digital divide as something that's really affecting our patients. And we're part of several programs, some grants, some government funded, to get equipment to our patients, to get them the technology, to get them the bandwidth and the training, and but also for the last portion to figure out how will we provide spaces where people can actually have privacy? Should we be having moving vehicles? Should we establish sort of like, you know, LCHC phone booths where you go in to talk to people? So we're really thinking about that because we don't want this next generation of healthcare to increase the inequities uh, that exist. So we really want to make sure that as we're moving to this next generation of healthcare, we are actually making things better and not worse. Are you taking tools or workflows from this year and saying, oh, this is actually a, a good way to think about things moving forward, you know, a, a, an interesting way, whether it's technologically or, or whatever, I guess, has it given you new insights into treating people? I think, yes, there are definitely some new better that, that have emerged. Uh, we are definitely thinking about some dramatic changes. And interestingly enough, about 60% of our patients uh, really would prefer not to do telemedicine ever again. But a good 40% of our patients say either, I want to stick to telemedicine or televideo or telephones, or I want to have the option of choosing to go to it occasionally. So yes, we are thinking about it. I know that the COVID-19 pandemic has been just economically devastating, uh, especially in communities like Lynn. And I wonder how the Lynn Community Health Center has reacted to what is, I'm sure, an economic crisis inside of a health crisis. How have you guys responded to that? Lynn is one of the cities with the highest proportion of what's considered essential workers. It's one of the major reasons why in the beginning, when we didn't know where our money was going to come from, we decided as a leadership team, we were just going to gamble our reserves. We decided we were just going to keep everybody at employed as much as possible. Because I just couldn't see us worsening the crisis in the city by laying off 200 people, 300 people. That was really a big way in which we, we contributed. I'm sure that's got to be a an enormous part of the organization is predicting where the next kind of difficult thing is going to be and how can you be of service inside of that. 
Yes. If you look, you know, 50 years ago, and actually your father was at the forefront of this as one of the founders of the health center. At that point, they predicted that mental health was going to be a huge deal. And there, and he and his partner, uh, Dr. Hayes, were actually 30 years ahead of the curve, right, in terms of recognizing how important behavioral health was. I think for us, it's natural to now be thinking, okay, the next crisis is around housing. So how, what do we need to build because whatever medical problems a person has, they do not get better when the person becomes homeless. We are connected enough with our community that we actually hear what's actually impacting them and what's bothering them and where they need us to use our voice uh, to advocate. Um, so I'm, I'm always worried. Uh, are, we really, are we really hearing what's happening? How do we know what's happening? How do we know what to advocate for? Um, but at this point, we know that housing is really the next big crisis, and that's what we're focused our advocacy on. So social justice continues to come up in the headlines surrounding the COVID vaccine rollout. It's just my understanding that in Massachusetts, some local health centers are really being targeted and supported by the state to ensure that the vaccine gets to them and that their supply is available in those cities and those communities. And I'm wondering if you in a city like Lynn, which I'm sure has a very high COVID positivity rate, how have you guys experienced the vaccine, its rollout in terms of accessibility and all the rest? So we've been very lucky in the sense that uh, the state has essentially provided us with whatever vaccine that we've asked for. Uh, we've also been enormously lucky in the sense that the city decided to dedicate a huge amount of resources, a significant amount of resources towards a vaccination. Massachusetts may be one of the rare states where they decided to prioritize health centers, particularly those who are in hot spots. Overall, we're seeing very good response in terms of um, African American community, Latino community. But obviously, it's requiring us to do extra in terms of outreach to make sure that we are calling our patients, particularly those who might be ambivalent. They need that one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody from their team before they're comfortable uh, allowing themselves to be vaccinated. Well, that is the end of our time. Kiami, this has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to me. Thank you so much for all of your thoughtful uh, answers to all of these questions. This has been incredibly informative to me. I've learned a lot. Uh, I hope you all will have me back to do more of these. If anyone is watching in the audience right now and you would like to learn more about the Lynn Community Health Center, how to support it, what it does, please visit lchcnet.org slash donate. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Kiami, for having me. This was wonderful. Thanks. This was my first prolonged interview and it was a great experience. So thanks so much, Jason. I think we nailed it. I'm going to be honest. I think we nailed it. I hope you guys enjoyed that short peek into just some of LCHC's COVID-19 response. I'll go ahead and share it. It's really been truly inspiring uh, to be part of the LCH team over this past year. Open it up now for questions. And as Yami introduced previously, he is joined by both Dr. Jeff Paczynski, our Chief Medical Officer, and Kim Eng, our Chief Operating Officer. Let's start by addressing some of the regional collaborations that made this possible. Kiami, you talked about it a little bit in the video that our response was really part of a much larger regional response and that we didn't just do this alone as LCHC. Could you share a little bit more about that? Yes, and I think that although I could wax lyrical on the regional collaboration, I think probably Jeff was really our lead in terms of connections with, uh, with the city, with the hospital. So I'll call on Dr. Praczynski to give us an overview of the regional collaborations that we did. I will try to wax poetical in your, <laughs> in your stead, Kiami. So I'm Jeff Pachinski, I'm the CMO and a family medicine physician. I've been here just about three years now. And I don't think we brag a lot about what we do. I think we're, we're humble individuals, but I, I guess I wanna humble brag a little bit about what the people I, I get to work with have done over the past year and just, the context of this is we did not do it alone as, as Lynn Community Health Center. We did it with the relationships that Kiami was mentioning during the interview. And so those started um, at the state level, really, and then the city, the Department of Health, 
Mass General Brigham, especially Salem Hospital locally, who we work closely with. And the reason we're able to progress the way we did through COVID, there was just two things I want to mention. One was leadership. We started out with an emergency operations center, ably managed by my colleague, Kim Eng, who'll be talking in a little bit about vaccinations that really partnered with it. There's a city emergency operations center that various members of the health center met with weekly. And we really had daily touch points, even with the Department of Health and the city of Lynn. And then also leadership from several areas within our health center. So our school-based health centers, which were closed during the pandemic, Several of the providers and staff there really stepped into vital roles that we needed, as well as our urgent care leadership and providers. So did not want to leave them out. And then the second way we really did this was through relationships. Again, with the, the groups I, I mentioned and Kiami had mentioned, but especially our bonds with the, the city. And I think with Mass General Brigham, Salem Hospital have really been strengthened through this as we've thought through, kind of planned what we do and then done it as well as the Department of Health and even Partners in Health from earlier on in the pandemic. So the things that we did as a health center, and this is where I'll try to wax a little bit poetic, I'm not gonna rhyme, but uh, we didn't close, right? So we saw patients throughout the pandemic at our urgent care center, we turned it into a respiratory clinic and changed the entire flow of our, of our health center. Our pediatrics team moved from the main site where they, they reside to the Western Ave, so about a mile away, and stayed open in order to see those kids that were less than five to make sure they were staying healthy and getting the immunizations they needed. And as you've heard Kiami talk about already, we switched a huge part of what we did to telehealth, being both telephonic and via video, and continue to do that, and we'll continue to do so, although not in the same, not in the same percentage. As far as testing, we really focused on testing early on. So we set up trailers. Again, this was with, with help with the city and MGB, but we have trailers in back of the health center where we continue to do testing. Mass General Brigham had a testing van that would do pop-up sites around the city that we did on our own and with Mass General Brigham. To do all this, we needed to set up labs. So set that up through the hospital and then the Broad Institute and then follow up for patients regarding education around quarantine, isolation, did that with partners in health and with our own kind of contact tracing team. So those were huge undertakings that we hadn't, we, nobody had done before, at least at the, the level we had at, the, at this level. And then finally, we opened up testing and quarantine site at Salem High School that Gargi Cooper, who's the med director at our uh, recuperative care center was, was an integral part of and did that again with, with the city of Salem and Mass General Brigham and a, an ambulance company. So those are just some examples of the partnerships and what we've done over the last year. So thanks, Kiami, for giving me the time. No shortage of wonderful relationships to talk about for sure. Um, another, another question to start off with is, and I see some are, are coming in question and answer functions, so thank you for those. Another piece that's touched on in the video, and I think a number of us will remember reading the headlines, particularly at spring and, and last summer, uh, but were some of the accommodations made for healthcare workers and others as a community. Kiami, what were some of those key examples that we had experienced here? It was really a community that made this happen. Yes, I think we, we have very short memories as humans. If you remember April and May of the first months of the pandemic, we didn't have enough equipment that we wanted. We didn't have any vaccine. And actually at the time, we still, we still didn't quite know how it was spread, how fast it spread, how dangerous it was. And so you have to remember that, although as Jeff said, we stayed open and we saw patients, there was a real risk of our employees getting sick. And I think most of our staff had resigned themselves that that was a professional calling and they were they were just going to do it because that's what was necessary. But many of them felt it was beyond the call of duty to expose their families to whatever viruses they might pick up. And surprisingly, this actually didn't start with us, but where we got a call from Salem State uh, University. Uh, I happened to serve on a board with one of the executive team members at Salem State, and they essentially arranged to grant us free of charge their dorms. So essentially, we had as many dorm rooms available as our staff wanted for as long as they wanted. They could stay there two days a week. They could stay there the whole week. 
Salem State did all the cleaning, they did all the all that backup. So now that was that was another collaboration that happened. And I can't remember how many people we ended up. I think we only ended up having 40 or 50 people that wanted to stay there more than just one night. Uh, but it was really great to be able to offer that for those who whose family situations required them uh, to not go home for, for the duration of the time that they were working. Thank you. That certainly took a village. I'll open it up to the questions from our audience now, and I'll start with the one that does have some upvotes on it um, at the top here, switching conversations a little bit from testing to vaccines. So many minorities, the communities are struggling with vaccine update. Are we, and if not, uh, what have we done about it? Even though uh, Jeff and I both carry medical degrees, I like teasing Kim because she is our, our chief engineer. So that's her degree. She's engineer Ang. You know, her last name is like the first part of her actual title, which I think is very funny. But uh, she was really the one who can, of uh, us three could really talk about our vaccine effort and how we've done in terms of racial equity, in terms of percentages. Kim, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kiami. Yeah, I just want to highlight to the partnerships that this took, really partnering with the city of Lynn, the city of Nahant, and MGB, Mass General Brigham. And so far, we vaccinated over 59% of the city of Lynn and uh, together have provided on our count, on our side, 74,000 vaccines, and I know it's more that have been administered by MGB and the city of, of Lynn as well. I have some data to share that I think highlights this question, so I'm going to actually share my screen. I think it'll be a little bit easier to see. So this graph just shows our ramp up. Many people probably know that we opened up a large back site at Lynn Tech, one of the schools, in partnership, like I said, with the city of Lynn, city of Nahant, and MGB. Um, at the peak, we were able to see over 1,400 patients per day and administer vaccines. And you can see here that we've administered over almost 74,000 vaccines to date. 40,000 have had at least a dose one and 36,000 of those vaccinated at that site have been fully vaccinated. So really impressive numbers. I think the, the obvious question is the equity question and what are we doing around this? I will highlight two different graphs. The top graph that I'm showing here, um, really we don't have great data on race and ethnicity data across the city of Lynn. We're using Lynn Community Health Center as a surrogate for that. And, and when we look at this equity question, so the top graph represents all of the Lynn Community Health Center patients and the racial and ethnicity breakdown of each. And then the bottom represents those that have either started or have been vaccinated. So what this highlights for us is that there's actually very little disparity if you look at it by grouping. So if I look at the top graph, 51% of our patients are Hispanic. And of those vaccinated, 51.27% uh, represent Hispanic patients. And so I think, and you look at across the board that you see that disparity very little. So, so what does this really mean? If you're a person of color and you're a patient of Lynn Community Health Center, you are getting vaccines in an equitable way. If you're not a Lynn Community Health Center patient, I think what we've seen, um, as you've pointed out in your question, that there really is a disparity. If you look at the state data, and just to pull out an example, if you are Hispanic, there's a 15% difference, meaning that 45% of the population of Lynn is Hispanic, but only 30% of those vaccinated in Lynn are Hispanic. And if you're a Black, which is 12% of those that live in Lynn, only 8% of those vaccinated are Black. So it's it's possible that this inequity is due to a slight difference in the way that the data is collected. We're looking at eligible patients here, so those over 12, and the state data is looking at 100% of those that live in Lynn, but I do think that there's definitely a disparity, and we're really proud of the work that we've done in partnership um, with the city to provide equitable vaccines to our patients. Thank you, Kim. Incredible work. Another question in our question and answer function here, talking about digital access challenges, intrigued by the digital access challenges linked to privacy and communications that have been more exposed during this pandemic. Are there any key learnings that the LCHC employee experience and the LCHC patients that are contributing to how leadership is redesigning systems for digital health equity in the future, particularly interested in, in chronic disease and the opportunity to reduce disparities there? Yeah, I think the biggest lesson that we learned is that we're not ready for it. <laughs> I think so, you know, you can send people home, you can send 300 people home with laptops, but are you able to support them? 
are you able to supervise them? Are you able to give managers the tools that they need to know who they need to support and who they need to reach out to amongst their employees? And I think the same thing is also for patient care, meaning that, for instance, we do a social determinant of health screen on all of our patients that we see, but we don't have a digital equity question in there, right? It's not built in. Do you have a laptop? Do you have bandwidth? Do you have space to do it? So I think part of it is that we've learned that we still have a lot of work to do just in terms of current status, what's happening out there. For instance, do poor immigrants have more or less bandwidth access than poor American-born uh, patients? Because we're assuming that if you're an immigrant, you need the broadband to communicate with your family from wherever it is that you come from, but we don't know that. So we need to find all of those things out. And I think once we know the scale of the inequity, then we can start figuring out what can we do to address it, particularly around chronic disease management. Uh, my, my fantasy is really that people get to choose what they want, meaning that you go to a website, you make your appointment, you get to this, and you decide at that point, do you want it on the phone? Do you want it video? Do you want group? Do you, what do you want? And also beyond just televideo and telephone, can we provide so the next technological jump where we're able to listen to people's heartbeats and we're able to get people's blood pressures, we're able to look into people's eyes and ears all remotely. So that's all things that we're working on. I think what we really learned is that we are not even in pre-K when it comes to providing telehealth services. And that's one of our big ambitions in the coming, the coming years is to make sure that we know enough about our patient population that if we start providing significant uh, telehealth services, that there is no inequities. It would really, really be sad if the digital inequity promoted the next big wave of inequities in healthcare. So that's one of the things we're very careful we want to avoid. Thank you, Kiani. It's certainly complex. I think we'll, we'll do one more question tonight and then um, we'll continue with others that come in via email for now. Some questions around homelessness and the coming housing crisis, uh, which Kiani, you did mention, I think, in, in the interview with Jason earlier. Uh, the Health Center did tremendous work during the pandemic. Finding affordable housing is already a challenge everywhere and especially in Lynn. Uh, the problem requires long and short-term solutions. Long-term, we need more housing. Short-term, what do you think is needed through your work that would have the most impact to help patients who are homeless and desperate for help right now? So I think that, I mean, obviously there's, there's an illness wellness sort of balance there, right? Obviously people who are homeless or experiencing homelessness who need uh, healthcare, we provide, we have mobile teams, we go to the shelter, we have the recuperative care center. So there's some work that we do around there. I really think that where we can have the biggest impact is actually intervening before people become homeless, meaning that there are several of our sort of sister legal agencies in, in Lynn that have the ability to provide legal advice and lawyers for people who are potentially facing eviction. And so the way I really see our contribution is trying to screen 100% of our patients, being able to identify those patients who are at risk and immediately referring them to those services because that really stops the whole eviction process from going on. Typically, most of our patients can't afford to have lawyers. They can't afford to hire good legal advice. So that's where I really see our role uh, in, the, in the immediate is how do we identify families who are at risk and we link them up with services that are already well established. We have formal links but through which we can refer people who are at risk. So for instance, I know that in the summer immediately after the, the pandemic started, of the 135 families that we had referred to our partner for Mass Coalition for the Homeless, of those 135 they referred, none of them got evicted. So that's really where I see in terms of immediacy the work that we have to do. Longer term, I see us participating in the advocacy in terms of affordable housing and how do you make that happen? How do we lend our voice, particularly now that our profile has been significantly elevated in the city with the major stakeholders and decision makers in power brokers in the city? How do we use that voice to advocate for longer term policies around housing? So that is a complex question. As we're coming to the end of our time, I just wanted to bring Jason on one last time, bring Jason back on camera. I think he's there. I just wanted to say, Jason, that I can uh, 
unequivocally say that uh, that was the best interview I've ever had in my life. Of course, it's the only like interview I've had yeah. in my life, but nevertheless, it was the best interview I've had in my life. Oh, thank you. I'm, it was my absolute pleasure. I'm only heartbroken that they cut both of our songs. I thought both, both were beautifully rendered and I can't believe it must have been a licensing issue or something like that. But uh, uh, no, I had a great time talking with you as well. It was so helpful, so informative. And to watch it back now, it's even more uh, impressive and, and compelling to, to see you dig in and, and help contextualize everything that's going on there. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you, Kim and Jeff, not only for being here tonight, but also for those 90 and 100 hour uh, weeks that uh, you provided for months on end in order to get us through the COVID crisis. So thanks so much. Thanks so much to our audience who has been uh, watching us and putting in the questions. Thanks again to our sponsors who are able to make this happen. And of course, uh, thanks to Jason and to his father who actually founded the whole health center that even allowed this thing to happen 50 years later. All right. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Any closing thoughts uh, from this group? Otherwise, we will post this online and we look forward to you joining us uh, in the future. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful night.